Bucks have won the World Series. Their first title in 88 years. Welcome to Baseball Seasons 2005, Second City Surprise. Go crazy, folks! Go crazy! Boston Red Sox, one win away trying to do something that the franchise hasn't accomplished in 86 years and that is win a World Series. A 1-0 pitch. Here it is. Red Sox fans have long to hear it. The Boston Red Sox are world champions. Amazingly, cathartically, and finally, baseball 2004 concluded with the end of an 85-year drought. The greatest Red Sox team ever. ever. And as the 2005 season dawned, anything seemed possible on the diamond, particularly for two long-suffering franchises in Chicago. Everybody was making such a big deal about the fact that they hadn't won since 1918. And here we were, we hadn't won since 1917. It had been a long time for the Sox and an even longer one for the Cubs, whose last title had come in 1908. I think what the Cubs and White Sox saw the Red Sox do last year, I think they know that there's a chance. They don't really believe in the curses anymore. If they can break their curse and break their drought of world championships, then so can we. Then, there were the franchises that had never won a World Series, eight who'd never been crowned champion, and six who'd never even been to the Fall Classic, including the Astros, who'd been in existence for more than four decades. It seems like longer than you should have to wait, uh, given the ordinary odds. But Houston's odds didn't get any better as 05 approached, when 04 midseason acquisition Carlos Beltran left the club in free agency. Still, the team was determined. Our objective is to bring a championship to, uh, to Houston, and we're still working on doing that. Other fan bases came into 2005 simply happy to watch baseball, namely in Washington, where political figures finally had something to unite them. Baseball is back, baby! Woo! You know, when they found out that the Expos were moving to Washington and that the Nationals were going to be playing at RFK Stadium on Capitol Hill, and everybody was excited to have baseball back. It had been 34 years since D.C. had had a ball club, and the new incarnation got a warm welcome and a special guest to throw out the ceremonial first pitch. The President of the United States. And if they were eager to get started on 2005 in D.C., in New York, the Yankees had been itching for a new opportunity since the previous October, when after reaching the postseason for the 10th straight time with the AL's best record, came that epic collapse, which led the club to reconsider its roster. They had to work again. They had to reconstruct that team a little bit. The reaction was basically get power arms. And on behalf of the New York Yankees and George Steinbrenner, Welcome to Yankee Stadium, Randy Johnson. You know, the bottom line is uh, I've been brought on board uh, to the Yankees here to help this team get to a championship, and nothing less than that is acceptable. The plan was for the big unit and fellow newcomers Jared Wright and Carl Pavano to erase the pain of 04. But things didn't work out as expected early on. Oh, what a nightmare beginning for the Yankees. How could you have a worse start than this? The Yankees were not just beaten. They were embarrassed. New York stumbled to an 11 and 19 start and found themselves nine games out of first by the beginning of May, searching for answers. I think the Yankees felt a good sense of panic after about a month into the season. The Yankees felt old. They're behind, and all of a sudden, these acquisitions aren't quite doing what they had hoped they could do. And the Yankees' bad start wasn't the only strange turn of events in the AL East. The Baltimore Orioles hadn't finished above 500 since 1997, but they came out swinging in 05. Among the biggest contributions came from their middle infielders, former MVP shortstop Miguel Tejada, Ooh. and second baseman Brian Roberts, who topped the AL in slugging in April. It all led to a hot O's start, and Baltimore took hold of the division. God bless America! Struck him out! The ball game is over, the Orioles win it! But even if the AL East was, for at least the moment, seemingly off kilter, there were other huge surprises all across the game. 
Prior to the 2004 season, the White Sox named Ozzie Guillen the game's first ever Venezuelan manager, hoping the former All-Star's intensity and personality would offer a jolt to the team. Hey, let's go, wake up here, let's go, come on, come on, let's go. When you're winning with Ozzy, it's the Mardi Gras, it's Cinco de Mayo. Come on, let's go, keep fighting, boys, come on. And when you're losing, it's the apocalypse now. They're not exchanging pleasantries. No, they're not. Think dinner is part of this equation. In 2004, Game Sox led the AL in home runs, but finished in second place for the third straight year, leading the front office to set about molding the team in their manager's image with a roster that played hard and fast. Scott Pesednik was the guy that gave us the speed that we, we hadn't had before. He got on base, he was always on base. Scott Pesednik, are you kidding me? Tadahito Oguchi, they brought over from Japan, was a prototypical number two hitter. To be honest with you, I wasn't very happy that he came because that was my position. We didn't know much about him. We knew he could hit. He had a great seasons over there in Japan. With Iguchi and Pusednik at the top of the lineup, the Sox played a style quickly coined Aussie Ball. Aussie Ball is all the rage. And the results spoke for themselves as the club jumped out to a 16-4 start in April. This is a smart ball rally going on right now. I think the players were comfortable with what Ozzie was doing, and Ozzie uh, placed a lot of confidence in his starting pitching. And Mark Burley, Freddie Garcia, John Garland, and company could go deep into ball games to provide a reliable backbone for the club. I thought they carried us from start to finish. I thought they went from first year to second year to third year to fourth year to overdrive. There was strong pitching each time out on the mound. John Garland, his second straight four-hit shutout. Ozzy Ball on the base paths. They're playing the game the way it's supposed to be played. And then, of course, a bit of trademark Southside pop. Two-run homer for Jermaine Dye. It all put Chicago atop the AL Central in the early going in 05. The hottest start in the 104-year history of their franchise. Meanwhile, in the NL Central, the defending league champion Cardinals look to pick up where they'd left off in 2004. I wasn't there for that, that 04 season, but when I showed up, everything just kind of fit right in. Everybody just kept on going. Mark Mulder joined a loaded Cardinals rotation that included Jeff Supon, Matt Morris, and one of the league's best arms, Chris Carpenter. And a seven hit shutout for Chris Carpenter. He was healthy. I think he had that determination, but he was just locked in. Powered by pitching, the always dangerous Albert Pujols and fellow MVP candidate Jim Edmonds, the Cardinals controlled the NL Central from the outset. If you're going to have a championship caliber team, you better get contributions from all 25 individuals. There's a the drive. Right center. Out in the AL West, the front runners were the newly renamed Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim, skippered by one of the game's best. Every year under Mike Sosia, you know, he's always uh, winning. Some of the great managers, you have to put Mike Sosia in that category as well. And the biggest threat in Sosia's lineup was Vladimir Guerrero, who'd come to the Angels the previous year and promptly won an MVP award. Guerrero's big bat was complemented by a fine supporting cast, including the steady Garrett Anderson and versatile Sean Figgins. One of those super utility type of players. He's been pretty much Mr. Everything for the Angels. We've seen him play well, everything except catcher and first base and pitcher. Wow! The team's newest part was shortstop Orlando Cabrera, fresh off an historic World Series win in Boston and eager to make an impact in California in any number of ways. Why are you always trying to catch a ball like this? Catch it right here. And Cabrera with a brilliant catch in foul territory. The Orlando Cabrera was a huge acquisition for us and his ability to not only play shortstop at an incredible level, but on the offensive side, give you a lot of versatility. Cabrera hits it high in the air, deep to left field, look at this! He's done it again! Cabrera wins it in the tenth. On the mound, Bartolo Colon is pitching some of the best ball of his career. 
Bartolo became the lead dog in our rotation when we signed him. But there are, there are a lot of guys that followed suit when you look at John Lackey and look at what he did. Lackey's racking him up now. That's six strikeouts tonight. And while the Angels set out to win their second straight AL West title, back east, another club was trying to extend a remarkable run of division dominance. The Atlanta Braves had ruled the NL East since the mid-1990s. 13th straight division championship for the Atlanta Braves. But in 2005, the rest of the division was determined to make a fight of it. The W is everything right now. Now, for their part, this Braves team had a different look than others of years past. And with Greg Maddox and Tom Glavin both gone, John Smoltz returned to the Atlanta rotation after a stint as the team's closer. As a closer for three years, I sat back and we didn't win a series. Struck him on and the ball game is over. And there wasn't many games that I was able to pitch and the organization looked at what made us better. And I thought making me a starter again it would give us some power back in the rotation. Strike three for the team of the Atlanta pitching staff. Meanwhile, a pair of familiar faces, Chipper and Andrew Jones, provided the pop in an offense that scored plenty of runs. Andrew Jones has done it again. It's changeup. Changeup. How hot can a guy get? You have a 3-4 with Chipper and Andrew. It's pretty easy to score runs. Further south, the Marlins were stocked with talent on the mound and took an early lead in the NL East behind one of the game's most dynamic young pitchers. Dontrell Willis defined the Marlins with his enthusiasm, with his smile, and with this windup that was incredibly fun to watch. Exciting young player. Boy, is he ever. And to help provide runs for pitchers like Willis, the Marlins signed slugging first baseman Carlos Delgado. It is gone! Grand slam! Delgado! A guy like Carlos Delgado, who on his bad years was 30 home runs and 100 RBIs, we felt like he was just going to be that piece that we needed. You got it! You got it! The one thing with our uh, division that year was, you know the Braves are there, the Mets were very good, the Phillies were very good. Hot. Hot in Philly. We had high hopes, but the Nationals, when they came in, that team was going through such a big transition. You just didn't know what you were going to get. What you got was winning baseball. just refuses to go away no matter what the situation. Under manager Frank Robinson, the Nats found themselves in first place at the break for the first time since 1994. Oliver dives and makes the catch. That's the ball game. It's been surprising, you know, to see how well we're, we're doing right now. That's the ball game. Hail to the Chief. Nobody thought that we were going to be two and a half games up you know, on Atlanta you know, to, to end, at the end of the All-Star break. So hopefully we could just hold everybody down. And just outside the Beltway in Baltimore, the Orioles were doing everything they could to hold on in the high-powered AL East. They're a good team. They felt a responsibility to catch up to the rest of to us, and they've done a pretty good job. But in June, the defending world champions heated up winning 12 of 13 and grabbing first place from the O's. Martinez and the Red Sox walk off with the win! As the dynamic duo of Manny Ramirez and David Ortiz ended the first half, 1-2 in the AL and RBIs. That is way out of here for Manny Ramirez. Both of them were so good that we felt like we, we had a chance if we could just get to that meat of the order at any point in the game. And with the prospect of getting Kurt Schilling back from the DL after the All-Star break, the Red Sox felt strongly about their chances. A healthy Kurt Schilling, he's considered our team ace. We haven't had that. And when we get that back, we're going to be that much better. After a slow start, the Yankees were searching for any way they could get better. Ultimately, I think Joe and I are looking to put this thing in the right direction. If you see something that bothers you enough, you know, uh, you don't need to wait to make moves. Two that paid off were call-ups Chinming Wong and Robinson Cano. Two-run home run by the rookie second baseman, Robbie Cano. Don't you know? Chinming Wong picks up his first big league victory. What saved the Yankees' season that year came in two parts. One started with bringing some of the youth into the team, and then the emergence again of these veterans. Alex Rodriguez had an MVP season. And it's gone off the block. It's a grand slam. He picks up 
his 10th RBI of the game. By July, the Yanks were squarely back in the hunt. But with a pack of competition in the AL East, nothing was guaranteed. As the 2005 season reached its symbolic halfway point, a pair of sluggers from rival NL clubs were engaged in a duel to outdo one another at the plate. Derek Lee's career year spurred talk of not only an MVP award, but a triple crown. I've just felt great every day, felt comfortable at the plate. Individually, it's been a great season. What an unbelievable season for Derek Lee. While in St. Louis, it was business as usual for another familiar MVP candidate. And Albert Pujols has delivered again. He's just simply one of the most dangerous hitters in all of Major League Baseball. Albert Pujols, brilliance at the plate, helped propel the Cardinals to a huge lead in the NL Central. And by summer, St. Louis looked to be coasting to the playoffs. A game-winning two-run dinger by Albert Pujols. But while Pujols and the Cards cruised, the battle for the wild card amongst a host of other NL teams was heating up. And by August, one improbable contender had seemingly risen from the dead. The Astros start the day 14 games back of the red hot St. Louis Cardinals in the National League Central. 15 and 30, hard to believe. 15 and 30 is, I mean, you're getting ready to pull a cement truck up on us and just bury us. Did you guys read the Chronicle this morning? It's certainly not good to have a huge tombstone of, of your season on the front page, but at the same time, everybody realized that if we didn't start playing better quickly, that, that we were going to be dead. The Astros, the NL wild card in 04, had struggled offensively with Carlos Beltran departed and Lance Berkman and Jeff Bagwell injured. We just didn't have a whole lot of firepower. Lowest scoring team in Major League Baseball. But despite their lifeless offense, Houston still had hope. For with Roger Clemens, Andy Pettit, and Roy Oswald, they had the best starting trio in the game. Our pitching was phenomenal. He struck him out. Oh, another beautiful <laughs> curveball. And we just shut teams down. Roy Oswald with a complete game shutout, a two-hitter. As they continued their work, our offense started to perk up, and things started to happen. The Astros have won four straight. They keep on pushing forward. And they were pushing thanks to a now healthy Berkman and the emergence of third baseman Morgan Ensberg. Morgan Ensberg with his third homer on the night. Oh, perfecto. With awakening bats, a staff that would finish second in the NL and ERA, and all-star Brad Lidge closing games, the Astros climbed back over 500 in mid-July and soon found themselves in the thick of the wildcard race. Astros win! And there were other late waking teams elsewhere in baseball, not just the Yankees, but two more AL clubs who used the summer to spring to life. The A's and the Indians were similar, young, talented, and on fire in the season's hottest months. This ball is with 27-year-olds Barry Zito and Eric Chavez serving as de facto veteran leaders, That's what I'm talking about, Joe. the Athletics overcame a slow start with a remarkable summer stretch in which they won 40 of 54 games to catch the Angels in the AL West. Ground ball through the middle. The A's have won the game in 10. It's going to be a battle all season long. We're very confident. We're just going to you know, let it happen out on the field. All right, baby. Sweet. All right. In Cleveland, the Indians were powered by a late-season push from their young talent. Grady Sizemore was on his way to becoming the face of the franchise with his combination of speed, power, and the way he could run down balls in the gap. The fans chanting, Grady, Grady. You know, our whole pitching staff, from CeCe, the big guy, you know, just shutting him down. Got him with the off-speed, the dominant performance. Cliff Lee, the whole year, has been great for us. What a job by Cliff Lee. You know, anything can happen in baseball, and we definitely have a good team and a good enough team to make a run. Nine in a row for the Tribe! So hopefully we can go out there and pull some off. There's no reason why this ball club can't make the playoffs and go deep into the playoffs. And with Cleveland joining the A's, Yanks, and Red Sox in the AL playoff hunt, it seemed like anything could happen on the way to October. 
there certainly is an air of anticipation in the clubhouse. I don't think they're scoreboard watching. On September 1st, 2005, 14 clubs were in playoff contention, and the National League was particularly crowded. When you go into September and you got six teams vying for it, you're scoreboard watching, you want to take care of your own business, there's a different fever for baseball, and there's a different intensity. It's getting really interesting. Things are getting crazy in the wild card race. Oh, my goodness. One team soaring above the fray were the Cardinals, who never let their division lead shrink to under nine games in the season's last two months. And the Cardinals are the National League Central Division champions. The San Diego Padres, meanwhile, took until game number 158 to lay claim to the West. The Padres are Western Division champs in 2005! Back East, a playoff mainstay looked to find their way back to the postseason. And alongside familiar veterans, the route was guided by a youth movement. The uh, Jeff Francoeur special, new uh, Louisville bats. <laughs> Wonder Boy. Riddled by injuries, the Braves played 18 rookies in 05, including two midseason call ups who made marks with their play and personalities. I think we made guys like Chipper, Smoltz, and them start to feel a little younger again. Uh, sometimes you can use a guy, some young guys, to come in and, and really just be a part of the clubhouse to keep things loose and have fun. We're not, we're not putting all this on, right? Frenchie and McCann, they understand their identity. They understand what their take on baseball is going to be. They want to play, and that is a refreshing thing. The roster moves work, and the Braves finish the season in a familiar place. 14 consecutive division titles for your Atlanta Braves. All these rookies who grew up in this area, this is a dream come true. If the Braves' playoff path was smooth, the clubs left to grapple for the wild card refused to make it easy on one another. It is becoming crunch time for everybody in the National League. The Phillies are a half game behind the Houston Astros, the leaders in the wild card race. The standings change daily, and surprise characters like a slugging rookie in Philly played huge roles in the drama. It's a grand slam home run for rookie Ryan Howard. Ryan Howard, early on, he said, wow, I mean, they've got themselves an MVP candidate here. That's how we do it. But even with Ryan and Jimmy Rollins crafting an impressive hitting streak. 36 straight game. The longest in the game since 1987, the Phillies' play was uneven in September. And every night mattered, with an Astros club continuing to surge with one goal on their minds. Four straight. They keep on pushing forward. They now have a two-game lead in the wild card race. We understood that as a veteran club, and let's start winning some series. Take two out of three, two out of three, maybe sweep some series. That was our mindset. Astros sweep the Phillies. An early September sweep of Philadelphia may have been the difference maker, as the Astros held off the Phils to rise from the dead and capture the NL wild card. And now they're dancing on those tombstones as they head for the playoffs again. Meanwhile, in the American League, the races were tight as well. By September, the Red Hot A's had lost their steam, and in the final weeks of the season, were outplayed by an Angels team that finished the year on a tear. The Angels, they have won the American League West for 2005. But the A's weren't the only AL team to limp to the finish, for in Chicago, a club that had cruised all year was suddenly collapsing. Sox look anything but a championship team right now. The White Sox lead is down to four games. The Sox lost 10 of 14 in mid-September, a swoon that coincided with a division rival in Cleveland catching fire. The Indians are knocking at the door. The Indians just keep on winning. The Indians won 17 of 19 to climb within a game and a half of Chicago in first. But the White Sox reawakened just in time to finish a wire-to-wire -wire division title run, winning eight of their last ten games. Line drive caught it. They are celebrating on the south side. The Chicago White Sox are the Central Division champions. While the Central Division title had slipped away, the Indians still had a shot at grabbing the wild card, along with bitter rivals atop the AL East going head-to-head -head on the final weekend of the season. After 150
59 games, it all comes down to this weekend. I think there was at least one segment of people that wanted, you know, Ollie Frazier three. They wanted a uh, thrill in Manila to finish this off. You got two playoff spots. You got three teams. It was great theater, great drama. It's crazy. The Yankees were still looking to secure a playoff berth. But the opener at Fenway was beyond their reach. So they turned to the big unit the next day, seeking their biggest win of the year. If the Yankees win, and if the Indians lose, the Yankees are in. And Johnson's fifth victory of the year over Boston, coupled with an Indians loss, got the Yanks to October for the 11th straight season. The Yankees have won the AL East. And so on the last day of the season, it was down to the Red Sox and Indians. When the afternoon was over, only one was moving on. Champions are headed back to the postseason. The San Diego Padres and the St. Louis Cardinals, they open up play in the division series of 2005. We have a prohibitive favorite. No way the Cardinals can lose to the Padres. With San Diego only two games over 500 and St. Louis boasting a major league best 100 wins. Their NLDS might have seemed like a mismatch. It doesn't matter who you're facing or what you're doing, how many wins they had during the season. It's who gets hot. One Redbird got red hot, and the series became the Reggie Sanders RBI show. Reggie Sanders could be some hero today. Bases loaded, one out. He's driven in two already. 3-0 pitch. Crang a long one. Did he get it up? The grand slam! Reggie Sanders with six runs back in today. And listen to the crowd. in three games. The Cardinals sweep the series three games to none. <laughs> in Chicago, the start of the Red Sox-White Sox division series was shadowed by the premise that if one curse had been broken in 2004, another could fall in 05. The Red Sox did it, why can't we? That's the attitude we took. Hey, these, these guys did it, Let, let's go in and let it fly. Three-run shot for Pachetnik, goes ahead. We came out that first game and just, you know, just pounded them. A home run for Canerco! Oh boy! The White Sox have won game one, 14 to two over the Red Sox. It never felt like we could get into a groove. We couldn't put anything together in the series. We made some mistakes. Off speed, Graffinino. Oh no! Through his legs! Those guys were really, really hot. Driven to left field! Before we know, we were down 2-0. White Sox need one more win to advance to the American League Championship Series. I think people know what, what the Red Sox did to the Yankees last year, being down 3-0. we got to go out there and try to finish these guys as quick as we can. And with Boston rallying in the sixth inning, Ozzie Guillen called on Orlando Hernandez to thwart a comeback. A base is loaded, nobody out. <sighs> one of the best performances I've ever seen a pitcher have. A pop-up. Pops him up as well. Swing and a miss. He ran around on a curveball. What a job of pitching by Orlando Hernandez. El Duque would throw three shutout innings in all. And when Bobby Jenks finished off Boston, the White Sox were moving on. We knew like, this is it, man. We got, we got the team to go all the way here. The Angels brought confidence into the other ALDS as the only team to own a winning record against the Yankees over the previous decade. The Yankees are just another team to them. They're in fact, not just another team, they're an easier team to beat because they don't blink. The Yankee myth means nothing to them. The team split the first two in Anaheim, and at Yankee Stadium for game three, the Angels were not intimidated by a sizable presence set to pitch against them. The big unit, Randy Johnson, the great left-hander, on the mound. This guy's nothing, let's go! This guy's nothing! It's nobody, let's go! Here we go! It was an attitude uh, that, uh, you know, we can beat these guys. A three-run home run for Garrett Anderson. That's how you play right here! That's how you play! If you have confidence, Sing. you can do about what you want. Strike three, and the Angels have gone ahead in this series. Two games to one. Give me some, give me some look. The Yanks evened things again in game four, meaning the series would return west for a decisive matchup. 
and Anaheim's bullpen got the call early. Bart really hurt his arm. Malone is gone here in the second. Remember when Santana came in and, and pitched a very, very strong five innings. What a job young Urban Santana did tonight. Angels lead it 5-3. to three. Escobar will be taking over. We had a strong pen at that time, and hopefully they were going to shut it down and hold leads, and we were able to do it on that night. Ground ball toward first diving stop. Erstad, the flip. The Angels are going to the ALCS. Pitching was also the headline as the Astros and Braves met in the NL Division Series for a second straight year. Tim Hudson going out there for the Braves. Huddy's a guy that depends on a lot of sync, a lot of movement, and he was so pumped up that I think he kept the ball up too much. Morgan Ensberg is having himself a day, and he beat him again. Behind Ensberg's five RBIs, Houston cruised to a Game 1 win, and the Astros look to build their momentum with the Major League ERA leader on the hill for Game 2 matched against the pitcher, making his first postseason start in six years. How will the Smoltz shoulder fare against Roger Clemens? Anytime you face Roger Clemens, it's going to be a battle. And on this night, Smoltz battled well. 13 out of 14 retired by Smoltz. The Astros took game three in Houston, but in game four, the Braves appeared to be drawing even. Obviously, you know, you're down 6-1. Everybody's going, okay, we're going to go back to Atlanta. And Lance comes through with a huge grand slam. Has hit a grand slam. But it puts us down by one. And uh, Brad Osmus comes up. Two down bases clean for Osmus now in the bottom of the ninth. No offense to Brad, but we're thinking, man, the last thing he's going to do is hit a home run right here, you know? Andrew Jones giving chase on the track. Links up, can't get it. That is a home run. From there, the game went into extra innings and kept going and going. The longest postseason contest in history. One of my fabulous, great memories of all time is looking out in my bullpen, and the only guy I see is Roger Clemens. The top of the 16th inning, Roger Clemens comes out of the bullpen. Then he just kind of mowed us down. Struck him out. Back to back K's. And uh, you're continuing to play this game, and it's going on and on and on. You had guys tired in Chris Burke. Was able to drive one in the Crawford boxes. It's gone! It's gone! What a way to finish! Chris Burke just purchased the ticket to St. Louis. We are underway in the National League's championship series. The 2005 NLCS was a rematch of the previous year's affair. And as the new battle began, Reggie Sanders was still on fire. And a long one into left field. Did he get him up? Oh, yeah, baby. That one doesn't have to get up. It is long gone. Two nothing part. What a postseason he is having. While Sanders provided the power, Chris Carpenter and Jason Isringhausen combined on the pitching. The Cardinals have won. But from there, the Astros' strength surfaced. Stride three call, a breaking ball in at the knee. As Houston's superb trio of arms turned in strong performances to lead their team to three straight wins. Unbelievable! The Astros go up three to one. St. Louis trailing in the best of seven, three games to one. With their backs against the wall, the Cardinals sent out their ace in game five. Their top pitcher, their top gun. In Chris Carpenter. Carpenter blows him down in order. But the story changed in the seventh. I was cruising along, got a couple guys on. And the Astros have set up shot. First and third, one out. Lance hit a three-run homer to make it 4-2. And the Astros put three on the board with one very big swing. I couldn't believe that I just lost the, uh, the series for us. It sure seemed that way into the ninth. They're one out of but then, a David Eckstein single and Jim Edmonds' walk brought Albert Pujols to the plate. As much as I love Brad Lidge, I don't want a piece of Albert Pujols. Oh, what a pull. In the air, left field, and Pujols has given St. Louis the lead. Albert hits that ball, and it's just like, oh, my gosh. Pujols' gigantic blast extended the Cardinals' season at least one more day. And we're coming back to Bush, folks. And on the mound in game six, 
Roy Oswalt set out intent on immediately reversing the momentum. My whole mind thought was, I have to set a tone from the very first inning. Here's a called strike three, but there's been a strikeout in each frame so far for Oswalt. That's his third. Oswalt pitched seven innings of one run ball and then handed it to the bullpen for another shot at making Astros franchise history. Come on, baby! Come get it! Come on! Yeah! For the first time in Houston Astros history, they will play in the World Series. U.S. Cellular Field on the south side of Chicago for the opening game of the American League Championship Series. After knocking off the Yankees in the Division Series, the Angels were looking to topple another AL heavyweight. Anderson rips one. That is a blast and a good start. A home run for Garrett Anderson putting the Angels on the board. Paul Bird started it. Bird, six of his and two runs. And the Angels' bullpen did the rest to take the opener. Swing and a miss, strike three. And the Angels win game one. Game two of the American League Championship Series. Staring at a 1-0 deficit at home, the White Sox were in need of a quick turnaround. Definitely a sense of urgency for the White Sox tonight. A burden Mark Burley bore all by himself with a masterful performance. Burley can't do any more than he's doing tonight. The White Sox definitely needed a win in game two, and Burley matched the Angels pitch for pitch and, and kept them in contention to win that game. The game was tied at one with two outs in the bottom of the ninth, and then controversy struck. Come on, AJ! Splitter! Swung on and missed, he struck him out. Krasinski is running, the ball is rolled back to the mound. Krasinski's at first base, what's the story? AJ, he's always in the middle of something. So, I think the umpire's got the play right. The home plate umpire said that ball hit into the ground. Krasinski is going down to first, the ninth inning continues. And Joe Crudy made sure it mattered. The pitch, swing and a drive, down to the field line. Sox have won. I always say I'd rather be lucky and be good. But luck wouldn't be a factor as the series shifted to Anaheim, thanks to the continued dominance of Guillen's starting rotation. Garland retires the final nine men he faces. Dominance continues. Garcia wraps up the third consecutive complete game. If I ever have another pitcher staff like that, I will truly be blessed. In game five, it was Jose Contreras' turn to go all the way. Playing in a ground ball to first. Canerco has it. He steps on the bag. The White Sox have won the pennant. The four straight complete games were a postseason rarity, but merely a footnote to the bigger history at play. The White Sox win it, and they're going to the World Series. It's been 46 years since the World Series has been here on the south side. It's our turn, baby! Our turn. Tons of White Sox fans their whole life, they've, they've never seen a World Series in Chicago, so just for us to get there, it was an awesome feeling. And after a season-long climb, the team on the other side of the field had reason to be thrilled as well. Houston Astros play their first World Series game in franchise history tonight. When I came here, that's what I was hoping to be able to help this club and help this organization do, and it was awesome to be part of. Game one, baby, here we go! From the start, Chicago was locked in against Roger Clemens. Deep right field, this might go! It's a gutter! Yeah! Three hits in the inning. The White Sox leading three to one. Roger Clement, he's gone after two. But after he left, the Astros rallied back. Oh, yeah! And this one is three to three. Boy! But the Sox regained the lead and then finished off the Strohs. A fastball struck him out swinging for a White Sox World Series Game 1 winner. Game 2 was a World Series classic. With Houston up two in the seventh, a longtime White Sox came up with the bases loaded. Canerco could do some damage. My only thought was, and this is why that team was good, because I think everybody thought like this, don't try to do too much. Even a broken bat here will tie this game up. 
It stayed that way until the ninth, when pinch hitter Jose Vizcaino came up with two out as the Astros' last hope. Vizcaino, a base hit to left. Here comes Bagwell. He scores. Here comes Burke. Here comes the throw. Going to be close. This line. Three. And the game is tied. And we'll go to the bottom of the ninth. A 6-6 tie. With one out, Scott Pesednik came up. A centerpiece of Ozzy ball all season long. But this time, there was something different. Deep right center field. This is way back in the gap. And it's a gunner! The White Sox winner! I think everybody, including myself, was a bit surprised that that, uh, game two home run came off of my bat. And the White Sox go up two games to nothing. Met at Maid Park, game three of the 05 World Series. Tonight, for the first time, it will be played in Texas. You in tonight? No. Hopefully, National League, I might be able to sneak in there and get a pinch hit or something like that. This game was another good one, going to the 14th when a former Astro got his wish. You know, this may be my only at bat in the World Series, and I said to myself, there's going to be a good chance of getting a fastball right here and hit a bullet out to right field. That's a rocket hit deep to right, and that ball is gone. A home run for Jeff Lump. Another unlikely power source for the White Sox. The White Sox are up three games to nothing. Is this the night the White Sox break out of an 88-year slump? Game four went scoreless for seven, and then in the eighth, Jermaine Dye stepped up. A base hit to center! Harris scores! The White Sox have a 1-0 lead in the eighth. And now the Astros are down to their last strike. If you look at any of those four games, they could have gone either way. It could have been a Houston sweep, but the White Sox were able to accomplish the sweep. Over the head of Jenks. Up the middle of the infield, Uribe has it. He throws. Out! Out! A White Sox winner! The White Sox have won the World Series! The World Champion! Their first title in 88 years. Takes a breath away to think 88 years. That's a long time. To bring that championship back home was absolutely amazing. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. The impact that winning a World Series had on the community was was a memory that I will never, never forget. The Sox would win 90 games the next year, but it wouldn't be enough in an improved AL Central as the Twins earned back the division title. Your Minnesota Twins are in the playoffs for the fourth time in five years. Detroit finished just a game behind Minnesota and grabbed the wild card. And like the Astros before them, streaked to the fall classic. The Tigers are going to the World Series! A mediocre 82-80 and 80 season nearly got the Astros back to the playoffs, but they ended up a game and a half behind the Cardinals, who after seasons of 105 and 100 victories, won just 83. Struck him out and the Cardinals have won the pennant but caught fire to soar into the World Series and then tame the Tigers in five games. The Cardinals are world champions of the 10th in their illustrious history. Showing once again that in baseball's wildcard era, glory plays no favorites in October.